this Tuesday night. Education is key to constructing the defenses of peace, says President Pakane during a speech at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. We connect with our correspondent on the ground. The Chinese RMB is approved by the IMF as one of the world's major currencies in a victory for Beijing's campaign for recognition as a global economic power. And an exclusive look into a new naval base on Korea's southern resort island of Jeju, now near completion after two decades of being in the works and center of controversy. Our defense correspondent is live in the studio. News Center begins now. A very good evening to our viewers in Korea and hello to those around the world. I'm Moon Go Young. This is News Center. It's day three of President Park Geun-hye's seven-day presidential tour and her last day in Paris, France. Now, before heading over to the Czech Republic, the South Korean leader visited the UNESCO headquarters. Our Hwang Sang-hee is traveling with the president. She joins me from Paris. Uh, Sang-hee, tell us more about President Park's visit to UNESCO. For the last item on our itinerary here in the French capital, President Park visited the UNESCO headquarters and gave a speech there. She is the first South Korean leader to do so. Addressing some 500 prominent figures Tuesday, President Park called for stronger ties between UNESCO and Korea. Noting the UN agency's contributions in the development and prosperity of Seoul, President Park said as partners, they must now work on securing world peace through increased cooperation. For one, the Korean leader referred to the deadly terror attacks in Paris and underscored the importance of education as a fundamental solution to such extremism. President Park also called for joint efforts to counter regional threats, particularly those stemming from North Korea's nuclear ambitions. She said the issue should be resolved through a peaceful reunification of the Korean peninsula, adding that cultural exchanges will be key for restoring unity between South and North Koreans. President Park also laid out specific proposals for cooperation in education, science and cultural sectors. Part of the plan includes working with UNESCO on the so-called Better Life for Girls initiative. At the UN General Assembly in September, President Park had pledged to donate 200 million U.S. dollars over the next five years to support girls in developing nations. President Park will now leave for Prague, the last stop on her seven-day tour. There, she will hold a summit with the Visegrad Group, which is comprised of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Poland. Kanyang? Our Hwang sang reporting on the President's tour from Paris. Uh, thank you very much, sang It's uh, very good to see you. The International Monetary Fund has given the green light to include China's currency, the UN, in its basket of reserve currencies. Joining this elite club marks an important milestone for policymakers in Beijing, but what does it mean for Korea? Arirang News' Hwang Ji-hye reports. Starting in October of next year, the Chinese yuan will become one of the world's elite currencies. The IMF on Monday added the yuan to its basket of reserve currencies, a designation known as the Special Drawing Rights, or SDR. The addition and the inclusion of the renminbi in the uh, SDR basket of currencies is a recognition of the significant reforms which have been conducted, of the significant uh, opening up of uh, the Chinese economy, of the uh, financial, um, more market-driven principles uh, that are being used by the Chinese authorities going forward. The IMF uses the reserve basket when providing emergency loans for countries like Greece and only four currencies, the U.S. dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen and the pound are included in the group. This is a great step toward making the RMB truly international and encouraging individuals and organizations of all countries in the world to hold it as well as invest it. And the inclusion brings Korea a step closer to its goal of emerging as an international hub for offshore yuan transactions as the country marks the one-year anniversary of its direct trading market with the Chinese currency. 
For the past year, the amount of average daily transactions of Wan Yuan direct trading stood at around $2.2 billion. And that matches over a quarter of the amount in Wan dollar daily transactions. Korea's financial authorities aim to further boost the market with a set of new measures. The market currently uses a market average for the one to dollar exchange and the cross rate for the yuan and dollar. But from next year, it will adopt a direct quote between the won and yuan. While the yuan's new status is expected to have a limited impact on the overall Korean economy in the short term, experts predict that it will ease risks stemming from possible global currency shocks as it diversifies currencies used in trade settlements. They add, though, it will also further raise Korea's dependence on China, an outcome that could have both negative and positive effects. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. It's been a dismal year so far as far as Korea's exports are concerned. Well, if it's any consolation, figures for November fell less than expected, which could be a glimmer of hope. For more on whether it'll be enough of a turnaround to get the economy back on track before the year is out, here's our Kwon Suha. Outbound shipments dropped by 4.7 percent in November compared to last year, marking the 11th consecutive month of decline. However, there were some signs of recovery. According to Korea's trade ministry Tuesday, the shipping industry picked up significantly from October, when the country posted a 16 percent drop. The telecommunications and display sectors also continued their upward streak. But overall, most exports were hit by low global oil prices. While total exports amounted to 44.4 billion U.S. dollars in November, imports came to 34 billion dollars, plunging 17.6 percent on-year for a record-high trade surplus. It's difficult to translate the surplus as positive since it's a result of worsening imports and already sluggish exports. Korea isn't the only one that's been suffering from weak trade. Some experts even say it's actually better off than many other countries. According to the World Trade Organization, global trade has dropped by more than 10 percent this year. But uh, in the midst of the downward trend, Korea is expected to jump up a spot to become the world's sixth biggest exporter for the first time ever after being in seventh since 2010. In terms of quality, Korea's export market actually saw some improvement as it diversified its export items, like in the display, cosmetics and processed food sectors. That's why experts believe while it won't reach it this year, next year Korea could make its annual trade target of one trillion U.S. dollars. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Well, following an extensive battle in Parliament, uh, Korean lawmakers finally gave the green light to a bilateral free trade agreement with China just in time for it to take effect this year. What will a free trade pact with the world's second largest economy and Korea's largest trading partner mean? The pros and cons. I have with me Dr. Kim in Chul, Professor of Economics at Seoul-based Sungyu Ingwan University. Professor Kim, good to have you with us. Glad to be here. Now, in addition to what I just mentioned, um, by this free trade deal, um, Korean businesses will have the reach of a 1.3 billion consumer base in China. How does that translate when, and how will that be reflected in the Korean economy? Well, simply speaking, uh, Korea can sell more in China's huge markets with uh, much reduced tariff rates. In addition, Korea can uh, enjoy ample opportunities in job creation and uh, better choices in consumption. And uh, moreover, uh, Korea can enjoy invisible benefit too. Uh, with the uh, FTA framework, the two countries, China and Korea, can establish a, an economically strategic partnership in trade and an investment, foreign investment. Moreover, these two countries can pursue together peace and economic prosperity on the Korean Peninsula. Right, so this will be a mutually benefiting uh, free trade pact. However, you know, as from a Korean perspective, we would like uh, for Korea to have the upper hand, if you will. So what should the Korean government and or Korean businesses do to make the most out of this uh, bilateral free trade pact? 
Okay, well, uh, not only the government and the corporate firms, but all of us, including the politicians, should uh, keep in mind that the price is not the only factor in the export market. Uh, quality, the product quality is another critical uh, factor in the global markets. So uh, instead of you know, wasting time arguing over the invisible you know, benefits and costs of you know, market opening with respect to or related to associated with the uh, FTA, they should focus, I mean the corporate firms focus on uh, the quality improvement of their products. And the government should encourage the corporate firms to increase their R&D spending mm -hmm. and to raise their you know, production technology. And also, the government should try to proactively eliminate regulations. Right. Um, another topic, China's yuan has joined the global currency, uh, benchmark currency basket. That was the news today. Now, uh, would this have any kind of impact on Korea's trade relations with China, positive or negative? Well, it would have a, you know, tremendous impact on the Korean economy in various ways. Uh, the IMF finally approved the yuan currency to be included in the you know, SDR uh, currency basket. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, you know, the yuan's inclusion in the SDR basket, the Chinese you know, currency has now become an international currency. Now, as China is becoming you know, more, uh, I mean, a bigger, now the, the second largest economy in the world, the, the world, the rest of the world is going to have more confidence in the Chinese economy and they would like to invest more in China. And then, um, you know, the huge, uh, I mean, the number of Chinese consumers who try to spend their money in overseas, you know, without the currency exchange. Mm -hmm. So in this way, um, all these things will have a positive effect on the Korean economy. Right. In, in all senses, China is a huge market for the rest of the world. Kim min Chai, professor of economics at sung University, thank you indeed for being here with us tonight. My pleasure. Samsung Electronics is taking its mobile chief, J.K. Shin, and another co-chief executive officer off day-to-day -day operations as the technology giant it looks to new leadership in attempts to revive its once booming smartphone business. Well, the group's annual year-end reshuffle uh, did not come with too many surprises this time, as our Kim in reports. There were no major changes this time around, but it's clear Samsung Group's latest shakeup took into account its flagging mobile division. Ko Dongjin, who was in charge of mobile research and development, was promoted to head Samsung Electronics' mobile communications business. He played a key role in the development of the flagship Galaxy model handsets, and his hardware and software experience is expected to strengthen the company's smartphone business, which has seen its profit drop amid increased competition from foreign rivals. Samsung also announced a personal reshuffle for other affiliates, appointing 15 executives to new posts. Samsung says the promotions were given to people who spearheaded cure developments, as well as those who will foster growth and bring about changes to the company. As for the owner family, Lee Seo Hyun, the youngest daughter of Samsung chairman Lee Gun Hee, was appointed president of Samsung CNT's fashion division. The list did not include heir apparent Lee Jae Yong, who's been acting as the head of the group after his father was hospitalized after suffering a heart attack in May of last year. The top executives at Samsung's corporate strategy office stayed in place. This could indicate that the group's succession plan is not complete. But once that's done, there will probably be a major reshuffle that may include his promotion. Industry watchers say for now, it seems a reshuffle led by Lee Jae-yong was focused on stabilizing the company amid his father's prolonged vacancy. Samsung is expected to announce a personal reshuffle for non-executive employees next week. Kim min Arirang News. A race against time, and that's what Korean lawmakers are in as they try to wrap up their review of the government's 2016 budget proposal ahead of a Wednesday deadline. 
They've already missed the first deadline on Monday, which means this is really their last chance. Here's our parliamentary correspondent, Chi Myung Gil. Lawmakers missed the first deadline for completing the budget review process, which was Monday, but hope to make the next deadline for the budget's passage on Wednesday. As the negotiations continued on Tuesday, the ruling Henry Party urged the opposition to cooperate in finishing deliberations on the 333 billion U.S. dollar budget bill. The opposition is making an issue of the funds allocated to regional social overhead capital projects, promoting the Semal movement internationally and the Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs, and trying to use those things for its own political gain. Another sticking point between the rival parties has to do with a free childcare program for toddlers proposed by the president. The opposition wants the central government to fund the initiative, while the ruling party wants municipal governments to fund it. On Tuesday, the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy Party urged the government to take full responsibility for funding the program. President Park Geun-hye pledged full government support for free daycare for toddlers up to age five, but the central government is refusing to allocate any money for the program for next year. Lawmakers are also seeking to pass other pending livelihood bills on Wednesday, including a proposed revision to the tax code that would allow the government to collect income tax from the clergy for the first time, starting in 2018. Smyongit, Adirang News. Well, following several years of protests and subsequent delays, the Korean Navy is gearing up to introduce a strategic naval base on Korea's scenic island of Jeju as early as January. Now, this is part of Seoul's efforts to shore up its maritime defense. The nation's uh, defense ministry press corps was given an exclusive preview of the naval base, and our national defense correspondent Kim Hyun Bin is live in the studio to share that experience with us. Kim Bin, so you're one of the very first reporters to have seen this uh, Jeju naval base as is today. Um, how was it on the ground? Uh, well, Gunyan, we hopped on a C-130 military transport plane and head over to Jeju. And once we came near the base, uh, we saw the newly built uh, docking ports with several warships and sink, and w- including uh, a Aegis destroyer and several submarines. And I thought that was pretty impressive. Right. So, what functions do we um, do we expect this new naval base to have exactly? Well, the Navy says it's going to be a civilian military port, and it expects to bring in more uh, tourists. And uh, and it's supposed to secure the ideal, and it's in the ideal location for securing Korea's southern seas. And let's take a closer look. And at the bottom of the picture, you can see the civilian port, which has a space for two 150,000-ton cruise ships. Now, a military official says that even an aircraft carrier could dock there. Now, a little north of there is the naval port, big enough for 12 combat ships. Now, what you see to the right is a submarine flotilla with space for three submarines. Now, officials say everything is now in order, and the base is scheduled to be finished by the end of the year. The South Korean Navy is putting the final touches on a new naval base on the southern tips of its southern resort island of Jeju. The base, which will station an estimated 3,100 naval personnel, covers nearly 500,000 square meters, and its docks extend five kilometers into the East China Sea. The base has been the source of intense controversy since it was announced more than 20 years ago, with local residents expressing deep opposition due to its impact on the environment. We are 94 percent done in terms of harbor and land construction, so we are scheduled to be complete by the end of the year. We've done our best to construct the highest tier civilian military port. Dozens of warships of all shapes and sizes have successfully docked at the port in test runs. Officials say it proves the port is reliable. We've held numerous mooring tests and checked all the safety precautions. Everything went smoothly, so we concluded the base meets all the necessary guidelines. Navy officials say the base has the capacity to hold up to 20 combat ships at a time. As a result, 
It will enhance the South Korean Navy's capabilities to counter North Korean provocations in the East and the West Sea. The new port also means warships can now reach the country's border islands in the West Sea, including Yongpyeong-do, in 15 hours. That's a cut in travel time by more than six hours, as currently it takes roughly 21 hours from Korea's southeastern port in Busan to the northwestern border islands. The new port is also seen as a naval choke point, from where North Korea would need to pass to sail further out to sea. A Navy official said the base will allow South Korean warships to intercept any North Korean ships attempting to transport weapons of mass destruction to other parts of the world. Well, officials say the new naval base will also allow South Korea to better defend Korea's Yeodo Island, uh, which is a strategically important submerged rock that China claims sovereignty over. Now, Yeodo is roughly 300 kilometers southwest of Jeju, and combat ships sailing there from the new base on Jeju will see their tra travel time cut to just four hours. Now, compared to the 13 hours that currently takes for ships to sail there from the naval port in Busan. Now, uh, what about uh, the new base bringing in more tourists? How will uh, that be done, and, and how big of an economic impact or economic benefit do we expect this base to rake in? Well, the civilian part of the port uh, could dock two of the largest cruise ships, so it could bring in thousands of foreign tourists and racking in millions of dollars. Now, just on the military side, uh, the Navy says that a little over $880 million were spent to build the base, but a senior military official I talked to said the Navy expects the return on investments to be about twice that, adding up to $1.7 billion within the next decade. Well, definitely, hopefully so. Uh, great reporting there. Uh, thanks, Champion, for that. Uh, sure thing. Artists and entrepreneurs open galleries and shops in an area where the rent is affordable. Now, as they become successful, the area becomes popular, attracting larger businesses and higher income residents. And that growing demand pushes up rent and lease prices, often driving out the longtime residents and original businesses in that area. This is Korea's version of gentrification, what we took a look at in part one of this series. Problem identified. Now, is there a viable solution? Gentrification, a new urban trend. Our news feature tonight, the last of our two-part series. How should Seoul change? That was the fundamental question behind this international symposium held under the theme Artist Gentrification and Urban Regeneration. Experts discuss gentrification case studies from other countries and the possible lessons that Seoul could learn from them. I think there are very few ex uh, cases of where gentrification has been successfully slowed down or stopped. The only way, I think, in which it's possible to control the process is through some form of uh, city planning, where the city actually restricts housing changes to certain, certain groups. New York City, which has a longer history of gentrification than Seoul, has a resident-based committee called Community Board that participates in the city's urban planning and development processes. The board's requests aren't legally binding, but the city takes most of them into consideration. Across the Atlantic, the UK has a national network of regional committees called Locality that empowers neighborhoods to form organizations and manage community issues on their own. Back in Korea, where gentrification has become the talk of the town, Seoul's eastern district of Songdonggu, for the first time in the country, enacted an ordinance last September to protect tenants from rising property values. The district office followed examples from overseas to form an independent residence committee that has the authority to allow or restrict businesses that wish to move into the district. If high-end bars and big franchise stores move in, they will destroy the district's commercial ecosystem. To prevent that, we created a committee comprised of local residents, including landlords, regional representatives and artists. The motivation behind such assertive action are the rising concerns regarding gentrification in the Songsudong area. Once a dull industrial neighborhood of factories, cheap rents attracted many artisans, which in turn transformed the area into a haven for high-quality handmade shoes. 
Empty factories and warehouses became galleries, while old houses turned into ateliers for shoemakers or cafes with a unique character. Before, this was a desolate factory area, and the streets were all grey. But now there's a street just for handmade shoe stores, and a lot of young students and socially conscious companies have moved in. So there's a younger spirit, more vitality, and a brighter landscape. However, being such a distinctive neighborhood as it sounds, Song Sudong's business owners are worried. This neighborhood is becoming more hip these days. On weekends, we're getting more visitors, so it's becoming more active commercially. But I'm worried the rent might go up. Korea's law guarantees a maximum period of five years for a rent contract at one location, which in other words means that once a contract is five years old, the landlord is free to ask the tenant to move out. So to help the tenants, the district office has built box shops or renovated containers where evicted businesses will be allowed to temporarily move in for a cheap rent starting next February. If business owners are forced to move far, they're going to lose their regular customers, so we are making it possible for them to relocate nearby. On the heels of these measures is the Seoul Metropolitan Government's announcement of its anti-gentrification plan last month. In essence, the city will mediate between landlords and tenants in order to reach peaceful agreements through providing financial and legal support for both sides. And if that fails, rescue evicted tenants with alternate spaces with cheap rent fees. Seoul plans to develop various measures that can help out small-scale entrepreneurs and allow multiple stakeholders of regional communities to coexist. But are government policies enough? Experts point out that voluntary participation on the part of the residents and tenants must come first in order to achieve substantial change. The residents, not government bodies, know better about a particular area's problems and how to bring about solutions. Expanding this kind of voluntary community participation is one solution to gentrification. Change in cities is often led by capital and governmental decisions. But in the end, it's the people who are affected by those changes. To protect them against the downsides of gentrification, the solution lies in communication and cooperation. Our leaders are working toward a deal to help steer the global economy away from the long-time dependence on fossil fuels. Bruce Harrison joins me live in the studio. Now, Bruce, what kind of progress are we seeing at the climate change conference in Paris? Look, on uh, the talks entered their second day, and multiple meetings are being held right now. Uh, the leaders are working to uh, they're carrying out detailed work to reach an agreement that would put the world back on track to limit global warming below two degrees Celsius. That's the main goal they established yesterday. Right. The talks have uh, moved beyond climate change um, in various ways. Tell us about that. Well, sure. Um, you have multiple meetings in Paris right now because these world leaders have gathered from all corners of the earth. Uh, most leaders used their opportunity during opening remarks yesterday to offer condolences for the 130 people killed during the Paris attacks. French President Francois Hollande said the two issues were inseparable, global challenges to be addressed for the next generation. U.S. President Barack Obama and Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan also sat down today, another example of how the summits moved beyond just climate negotiations. Those two discussed how Turkey and Russia can work together to de-escalate tensions. There's no doubt other world leaders will take advantage of the climate summit to work through other issues facing their countries. Still, they're in Paris to discuss global warming amid dire warnings that a failure to agree on strong measures would doom the world to even hotter average temperatures. Indonesia says a faulty part and the pilot's response led to the fatal crash of an Air Asia passenger debt. The plane crashed into the Java Sea last December, killing all 162 people on board. In the first public report of the crash, investigators didn't give a single reason for the disaster, but said there were a number of contributing factors. Among them was that pilots lost control of the plane because of the way they responded to a faulty rudder system. 
It caused the aircraft to depart from the normal flight envelope and enter a prolonged stall condition that was beyond the ability of the flight crew to recover. Investigators said stormy weather wasn't a factor in the accident. All right, Bruce. I mean, in other words, it's a string of uh, technical failures, but in the end, it's really the pilot's response that leads to a plane crashing or not. So I suppose that that is a factor that needs to be taken note of. And this crash is just part of a string of accidents that Indonesia was facing. Sure, yeah. There's been several, uh, even this fall, one in October, 54 people were killed. One in August, 10 people were killed. Uh, safety regulations are in play as that industry rapidly expands and the more people are flying. Right. Uh, aviation industry safety comes first. Thank you, Bruce. It was another chilly morning here in Seoul, uh, but it actually felt relatively warmer in the afternoon. So for the weather update tonight, let's check in with our Lee Ji-hyun. Uh, Ji-hyun, what do you have in store for us? Good evening, Kanyang. As you just said, we had a chilly morning to kick off the first day of December, but things got pretty mild in the afternoon with a high of 10.4 degrees Celsius here in the capital, and that's about three degrees higher than the seasonal average. And tomorrow is shaping up to be the opposite of today's weather. We'll have a mild morning to start out the day, but highs will be slightly breezier than today with rain in the forecast. So, uh, how much rain will we get? Not so much. 5 to 20 millimeters of precipitation is in store for the entire nation. And mountainous regions of Gangwon-do province will get snowfall of 1 to 3 centimeters. And the rain clouds will push a cold air front to the peninsula. So things are about to get much chillier with temperatures to plunge to freezing levels accompanied by snow starting Thursday. And these cold conditions are expected to last till Sunday. So do keep that in mind and let's move on to tomorrow's temperature readings. Daily low here in the capital will kick off at 5, 3, 4 at Daejeon, 4 in Daegu and 10 in Busan and Jeju. And afternoon highs will be slightly breezier than today as the high here in the capital will rise up to 9, 12 over in Daejeon, 11 for Daegu, 16 in Busan and Jeju will reach up to 17. Now that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. Well, the world at your feet, how would you like that? That is a broadcast on this first day of the final month of 2015. I'm Moon Gan Young. Thank you everyone for watching. We hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow on News Center.